Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior English A. And our objective now for the hour is to work with the text Beowulf. Now, I want to talk about the text Beowulf in regards to plot summary. What do I mean by that? In other words, I'm just going to review the story, the epic poem Beowulf. Okay? One of the reasons why I have to do that is that, as uh, a number of you pointed out, the entire text of Beowulf is not included in your hymnal. Got me? You only have certain cuttings from the story. I want to make sure that you know the entire story. So I'm going to review, using the Beowulf packet that I've handed out to you, that information, I think, in the Beowulf packet, starting on page 3, actually outlines the entire story. And I want to outline that with you. So as I'm working, you're just taking notes. We're just bullet pointing at level 1. What actually happens in the Beowulf epic? Well, we're told in three parts this story. So that's the first thing you want to identify, is that the Beowulf epic is actually an epic of three parts. Now, I need to say that because your hymnal does not actually demonstrate the three parts of Beowulf so cleanly. Uh, and in no place in the actual epic, right, Mr. Paulson, does it say Beowulf part one, Beowulf part two, the way you would maybe see in a book where there would be chapter one, two, three. It's not like that. But we have identifiable parts, and there will be some debate about the third part in regards to where, how long it came along after the first two parts. Let's make some general observations about the Beowulf epic. One, the first thing we need to say about this Beowulf epic is that we do not know who the author of this poem is. We don't know. Our dates for Beowulf are going to run somewhere between 750 and 1000 Common Era. Okay, As early as 750, 750 years after the birth of Christ, we know that there's some mention of this bear man, Beowulf, okay? This strong and mighty warrior who does amazing feats of strength and fighting. Okay? By the way, I should point out, if you are at all into superheroes of any kind, whatever yours is, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and all of the other ones, Wonder Woman and the like, if you get into any of those DC comic types of characters, all of those kinds of characters trace back to Beowulf. Okay? In some ways, you can think of Beowulf as the first superhero. Okay, because he fights monsters that are not necessarily human, etc., etc., right? Okay. The second thing we want to point out is that we believe that two monks, religious monks, were the first ones to write down what is actually an oral tale. Now, Mr. Hernandez, when I use the word oral tale, what does that mean? It wasn't written originally, it was spoken, right? It's a spoken story. Around the campfire, people gathered, and then this story gets told that ultimately gets written down. We feel pretty confident that we know it was written down for sure by 1000 Common Era, which is why we use the, the date 1000 Common Era, where you could actually find evidence that this story is finally written down in, as Mr. Paulson pointed out for us yesterday, in Old English, right? The story is going to be written for us in Old English, okay? Number three, we know that this story gets used as a poem, right, for fighting warriors. So that's the third thing we want to say. This is a poem of war. It is a poem of war for soldiers, for fighters. All right? And because that's the case, we have reason to maybe believe that this is an early form of propaganda. Whoa, 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 what do I mean by that term? Propaganda. What does that term mean? If I want to convince you to do something, I can create a work of propaganda that can make you very excited to want to do it. That's what we mean by propaganda. For example, we believe that this poem was maybe chanted before men went in to fight in battle. I mean, if you'll think about it, it makes sense. Before certain of the people sitting in this room go out to perform in athletic contests, Often music is listened to. Why come? Why, Mr. Roth Lindner, does do athletes listen to music before they go out to perform often? It, yeah, yeah, we use even the term, it gets you pumped up, right? That notion of getting pumped up is what I'm talking about. This text, Beowulf, apparently was used that way for young warriors. Now, if you'll think about it, it makes sense. Dude, if they're slinging around 30-pound swords, 
the likelihood of you coming out alive, not so good. So one of the questions is, how do you convince young people to go off and fight in the middle of these terrible wars? One answer is, you give them a hero like Beowulf. Do you got me? So as we look at the poem Beowulf, we're going to ask, what are the instructions to young soldiers? And we're going to see them pretty quickly right away. Okay? Now let's go to the text itself. The Beowulf text subdivides into three parts. Part one actually doesn't begin with Beowulf at all. Part one begins in the land of Denmark, the land of the Danes. You definitely want that in your notes, the land of the Danes. Now, if you are looking at your packet now, page one, and I recommend that you do so, do you see that little map on page one? Do you see that little map that's there? Yeah. And do you see the word herot? Circle that word, the word herot. H-E-R-O-T. Go ahead and find it. I'm sorry, you probably need almost magnifying glass to be able to find anything on that map. But do you see where it says Herod? Yeah. All right. Now, we, if you can circle that, we are in the land of the Danes. By the way, do you notice to the east there's that land called the land of the Geats? That, it, by the way, is not Geek, G-E-E-K, but Geat, G-E-A-T. Do you see it? You might want to put a little box around that word. Because that's going to be the land where Beowulf actually comes from. Beowulf is not Danish. The very opening, are you ready for this? This is kind of cool. The very opening of the Beowulf epic actually begins with the death of a king. And we're told in Denmark, they take the body of that king down and they put him on the, on the deck of one of their big ships. Then they pile the ship up with gold and jewelry. And then we're told they push the ship out into the fog. In this part of the world, fog comes in off the ocean, and you can see nothing. So they push the ship out into the fog. And in the morning, when the fog is gone, guess what? The ship is also gone. Of course, they believe then that the king's spirit has gone up to heaven. Now, hello, treasure hunters have read the opening lines of Beowulf and said, in the North Atlantic Sea, there has to be some ships at the bottom of the ocean. We know what happens, right? The ship went out in the night, got caught in a storm, probably wrecked and went down to the bottom of the ocean. Where's all that gold and jewelry? Because, dude, if you could find any of that on the bottom of the ocean, you'd be seriously in the bank. Would you agree? You'd be an instant multimillionaire. And so people have taken out little submarines and gone down to the bottom of the ocean looking for some of this treasure that they have assume is probably there because you wouldn't write this in a poem unless it probably was done once or twice, right? We're told that in the land of the Danes, a, set, a new king comes to power, a second king, and his name is Rothgar. Now we're going to learn how to say these names so you can actually practice saying out loud a couple of times, Rothgar. Now for those of you who are looking for spellings of all of this, that's what I think page two maybe of your packet will provide for you, correct? Page 2, you can see the spelling of King Rothgar. We're told two things about King Rothgar that we want to write down in our notes. One, he's a great and mighty warrior. If you want to become a stud in this Anglo-Saxon culture, the way you do it is by swinging a sword. <clears throat> okay? Notice today, we go to war, but our president doesn't fight in the war. Even our generals don't fight in the war. Our generals sit way, way behind the lines and they make decisions, correct? In the Anglo-Saxon times, if you wanted to be the leader, you literally went out and fought in the war. You were the strongest fighter, and we're told Hrothgar is a great and mighty warrior. Number two, the second thing that he does after he defeats all of his enemies is that he is a very generous king. He is what we call a ring bestower. He builds a large mead hall. M-E-A-D. Mead Hall. Now, does anybody know what mead is? What is mead? Does anybody know? It's, it's early beer. It's an early form of alcohol or beer. Now, some of this beer got trapped inside of a, 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 of, of a container and was found a few years ago, and they proof tested this stuff to 200 proof. Powerful alcohol. Got me? And they thought, good heavens, you can't drink alcohol like that without killing yourself. Wait, I'm not done. They found out that they didn't drink this alcohol out of glasses. They drank it out of bowls, large bowls, mixing bowl size, where you had to have two hands to pick it up. And you would pick up the beer, mead, and you drink it out of a bowl, we're told. 
which accounts for, we believe, why these fighters must be huge men. They have to be large men to be able to drink an entire bowl and not die of the level of alcohol they were drinking, right? Okay, And we're told that they love to drink this mead or this beer inside of a mead hall. Rothgar will call the mead hall Herod Hall, H-E-R-O-T, Herod Hall. Now, what does this look like? Well, it's kind of like our gymnasium. It's built kind of like that. It's a large room. Down the sides is where they'll sleep. In the middle is a big pit for the fire. On one end is where the king sits. So, in other words, all of the warriors basically live in this large gymnasium-styled room, right? Where they drink, they party, they sing songs, they like, have lots of fun. And then, of course, they go off and fight in battles. And then that's just where they come back to. The king, Rothgar, lives also there when he's sitting on his throne. Do you got me? That's the beginning of our story. But we're told about a monster. A very interesting and particular monster. His name is? Grendel. And we're told Grendel is a strange monster. He lives out in the boggy lands. Now, some of you have heard the term, the boogeyman. You just didn't know where it came from. It comes from Babel. Wait a minute. Boogie is not the actual word, though. Boogie is a derivation of boggy. What are bogs? Well, imagine if you drove from here to Tensley, and the ground looked the same as the Badlands that you're familiar with. And you get out of your truck or car and you start walking across the Badlands and it feels just like the dirt you walk on. And then all of a sudden you put your foot down and your leg just starts sinking into water mixed with mud. We know of them, of course, as the swamps, right? The bogs are the swamps. And we know that all over England you have these kinds of places close to the shoreline. They're really dangerous. Children go out into the bogs they will die. They will fall into quicksand or this mud stuff. The mud just sucks you down and you die. You, you literally drown to death. So we believe stories were invented to frighten children away from these areas, from the bogs, the boggy areas, the boogeyman. Grendel is a classic example of the boogeyman. He lives under the ground, we're told, down under the water, and he is a... Bad monster. Now, this is important for your notes because lots of elements of early Christian theology find their way into this poem. And we're told that Grendel bears the mark of Cain. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cain? Does anybody know that story? Well, what's the story of Cain and Abel? Well, the Bible will begin with the creation of two people, a man and a woman named Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, you'll remember, eat from that special fruit of that tree. They get jacked and thrown out of the garden. And then they have children. The first of those children is named Cain. The second is named Abel, right? So they have, a, they have two sons. We're told that Cain and Abel, however, as brothers, get in a fight where Cain kills his brother Abel. Right? So they, he kills him. The first murder, we're told, in that, in that, in that book called the Bible, right? Cain is cursed, we're told, by God and given a special mark. We don't know what that is. But in this poem, it's to be a really bad monster. Okay? And so he has the, the mark of Cain. What does he look like? Well, for those of you who have ever seen that really old, scary movie called Aliens, when they decided to make that monster in Aliens, they went back to Grendel. Because Grendel is one really scary monster. First of all, he has scales like a snake. He's a large beast. He has teeth within teeth. So when his teeth come out, another set of teeth come out that are razor sharp. He has strong hands. He has a tail like a, a, like a dragon that could whip it around. Okay, And so he uses his tail in fighting as well. He also has magic charms. So when you try and fight against him with weapons, the weapon just hits him and falls off of him. Okay? We're told this Grindel monster starts sneaking into Herod Hall, where he begins to eat some of the men. So we should point out, he's a man-eater. He likes to just kill people, and he does it just for fun. Herod Hall empties, and the rumor goes out all over the place that a terrible monster is there. We are told then, next part, we are told then that Beowulf, living in the land of the Geats, hears about this terrible monster. And he decides to visit the land of the Danes. He shows up. 
he shows up with a small entourage of warriors, only 13, and he's ready to fight against Grendel. But first, he has to go in front of King Hrothgar. Two important things. One, when he goes in front of Hrothgar, he does not go with all of his other warriors. Two, he leaves his weapons outside of the hall. Why come? Why does he do that? That's right, to show that he's not there to kill the king, but he's there to help the king. He goes in front of the king and he says two things. One, I'm here because I'm a hero where I come from. Two, I want to fight against this monster, Grendel. Will you let me do that? What do you imagine Her um, Hrothgar says? You bet I'll let you do that. Beowulf says, here's the deal. Can I make two requests? One, I want to fight against this thing with my bare hands. I don't want to use any weapons. Right? I want to make it harder on myself, in other words. I want to fight with just my bare hands. Are you okay with that? Rothgar's like, dude, do whatever you got to do. And he says, secondly, if I die, will you please return my body back to my king back in the land of the, uh, the, of the Geats? His name is Hygelite. Will you return my body back there? The king says, you bet, you bet, I will do that. So off, all of the soldiers go to Herod Hall. They lay down to go to sleep. Under cover of night, Grendel comes into the hall. He grabs a couple of men and he quickly eats them. And then he says, we're told in the poem, he puts his hand on Beowulf. And as soon as he does that, Beowulf grabs him back. And we're told that the minute Beowulf grabs a hold of Grendel's arm, Beowulf has the strength of 40 men, we're told, in his hands. And the minute that he grabs his arm, the monster realizes, uh-oh, it's over. And in that moment, the monster tries to get away. Beowulf ain't letting go. So the monster, we're told, pulls away from Beowulf. He has a hold of his arm. And the arm tears away from the body of Grendel. And the body of Grendel, the rest of him, runs home to die. In the meantime, for the first time in literature, we hear an interesting word. The word trophy. See, some of you live in houses where when you walk in the door, there's animal heads stuck all over the walls. Now, people who are unaccustomed to this have the obvious question. Seriously? What's up with all the dead animals sticking off of the wall? And it's an interesting question. And, of course, it can lead to all kinds of interesting responses. The one response that you can now give is, we put things on the wall because we learn how to do that in a famous poem called Beowulf. Yes. This is what apparently they did. You took a body part from the person or the monster that you killed, and you hung it up. And that's exactly what Rothgar does. He hangs up that huge arm of Grendel, and they, hurrah, everything is restored. They come back to the part to partying in Mead Hall, in the Herod Mead Hall. Everything is great. End of part one. Part two. I'm making notes now as we go. Part two. The story ain't over. Have you ever been with a really good storyteller? who can like tell the story, and then you think the story has ended, and then all of a sudden there's the next part of the story. A classic example of this in film, it'll date me, but I'll use it nonetheless. A classic example in film is the very first Friday the 13th. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the very first one of these movies. They made, what, 130 of them now? But uh, the very first Friday the 13th. But, dude, this was a brand new film when it came out, and everybody went to see this film, and I can recall being there, uh, watching this film on opening night, and it was that same slasher kind of film. Of course, by the time you guys ever watched any of these things. Nobody was really frightened by this stuff that much anymore, right? Because he'd seen so many of them. But the original was pretty good. And it goes through the whole film. The girl, you know, does her thing. She wins, like I say. And, and you think the film is done. And there's a, uh, the morning is coming up, and there's, uh, you're on a lake, and there's a little boat there, and she's in the boat, and you feel, and everybody's reaching for their keys, like, okay, this is the end of it. We got, you know, it's time to go out to our cars or whatever. And then from the other side of the boat, comes this thing, jumps out of the water, grabs her, and that's the end of the film, and then the credits roll, right? In other words, we're getting ready for the sequel that would become ultimately a whole bunch of sequels of Friday the 13th. The Beowulf ethic does the same thing. Right about the moment that you think it's all over, oh, good, Harrod Hall, everything's written. No, part two, Beowulf has a mama. Now, the translation here is sometimes called Beowulf's mom. Some, or, or, I'm sorry, not Beowulf's mom, Grendel's mom. Sometimes it's called Grendel's Damn, Grendel's dame, Grendel's damn. Grendel has a mom. She is a, are you ready for this? She's a witch. She lives down under the bogs and she casts spells. She's a witch. She comes under cover of night. She sneaks into Herod and she kills one and only one warrior in vengeance for her son coming back home dead. Unfortunately, that warrior though is a very particular warrior. His name is Asher. He is Hrothgar's greatest warrior. 
He's dead in the morning. And then Grendel's mom goes back. Beowulf isn't there. Isn't that convenient? Beowulf isn't there. He has to be called for. And we're told he comes tramping into the hall where he asks, how's it going? Now he knows something's up or he wouldn't have been called, right? How's it going? And sure enough, Rothgar is ready to tell him it's really bad. Asher is dead. There must be another one of these monsters. Beowulf says, no worries, I'll take care of everything. Only this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out, I'm going to go find this monster, this Grendel's mom, and I'm going to kill her. But before I go, I need you to weapon me up. I need full weapons. I want armor, and I need a sword. What? Think about this for a second. To go and fight against Grendel, this strong and mighty young gun, young male monster, he wants to fight barehanded. But to fight against the old fart woman... Dude, what's up with that? He wants to put full armor on and he has to have a special sword. How come? Why does he need weapons to fight against a woman when he can go hand-to-hand -hand combat with a man? Uh-oh. We're getting, yeah, we're getting, a, we're getting an interesting double standard here. It basically says what? Women don't fight the way men fight. Right? Women fight different from men. We've got a sexual double standard introduced here for the first time in our literature of, of England, right? Guys will go straight up, face to face. The suggestion here is, well, Grendel's mom's not going to fight quite the same way. Notice, Beowulf has to go to meet her, right? Grendel came to meet him, right? She, he has to go and find her. Are you ready for this? She almost kills him because she fights unfair. She's deceptive, isn't she? And she puts all kinds of spells on him, and ultimately he almost dies. Yeah, he does, he almost dies. In the process of killing her, however, he almost dies, but he is able to kill her, and then down under in the boggy lands, he takes the head of Grendel and he cuts it off, and he brings it to the, to the top of the water, and Grendel, is, his head, is taken back as a trophy that's put on a wall. So for those of you that wonder, why do they put trophies? Now, see, think about this. You normally don't put trophies on a wall of a small elk. Or some kind of little midget animal. Right? Right? What do you put on the wall? If you're a game hunter, you got it. It's got to be something that will have a high boon number or something, right? That allows for you to know that this was a big time find or conquest, correct? And what else do trophies do? They do. They're like, it's a way to say, ha, 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 I can do what you can't do, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, in their end, no matter what we call it, whether it's a trophy when we were in Little League Soccer or it's a big time take of an animal, trophies help us to remember, right? To remember what we've done, right? Remember something, correct? Okay, so end of Beowulf Part 2. You want to write this down in your notes. Beowulf brings back Grendel's head. Hrothgar will have a famous speech that we'll talk about where he says, whoa, you are some kind of hero. You're going to be remembered forever. And let me give you some words of advice. And that's called Beowulf 2. Beowulf 3. Beowulf 3 is an add-on. Let's say that for our notes. Beowulf 3 is an add-on. It happens many years later. Beowulf is back in the land of the Geats where he is. Are you ready for this? He's been a king for 50 years. So he's an old fart now. He's an old fart. Word comes to Beowulf that a terrible dragon is flying through the air and burning up people in their homes. A dragon? What is a dragon? Now this is fascinating. If I were to go right now down to any one of our elementary schools and walk into a third grade classroom, I could ask, tell me what you know about dragons. And all those kids would say pretty similar things, wouldn't they? They would say things like, well, they have a long tail, they have scales, they have a mouth that shoots out. Fire. What color are they normally? They're, they're either red or green, right? So we, 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 we know this, right? These, these stories. Well, now, the question is, when you go to a zoo, have you ever seen an animal that can fly around and shoot fire out of its mouth? Mm -hmm. See, this is an interesting question. Where do you even come up with an animal like this? The answer, by the way, is Beowulf. This is one of the first times that we get told about these dragons. It gets more interesting. Dragons like treasure? And they will set on large amounts of gold and jewels and diamonds and money. Gold cups and stuff like that. And then they go to sleep for a thousand years. And then when they wake up, they know if any of the stuff has been taken. 
How do they know that? And then they get really mad about it. all of this coming from Beowulf Part 3. Got me? This dragon, we're told, discovers that a cup, a golden cup, has been stolen, and he's mad about it, and so he decides that he's going to wreak vengeance. Well, Beowulf decides, it's time for me to go back and fight one more time. Interestingly, he wants to fight the dragon himself, even though now he's an old fart. Are you familiar with growing up in a house with some old guy who wants to go out and shoot basketball with the young guns, and then he comes back in, he's like, oh, right, and all of that, and everybody's teasing him, right? Dude, dude, what's up with your back? Shut up, leave me alone, you know, that kind of thing. Beowulf is an old fart, but he still wants to go fight against the dragon, and he takes with him some young gun warriors who promise that they're going to stand by him and fight with him. He walks out in front of the dragon's lair. He calls out to the dragon, come out. And the minute the dragon comes out, all of the warriors turn and run. They're like, whoa, 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 we didn't sign up for this. And they run, especially as Beowulf stands in front of the dragon. He starts shooting fire at Beowulf. All of them run, except for one. There is one warrior. His name is Wiglif. Wiglif is an interesting cat. He taunts the other warriors, and he says to the other warriors, what? We're going to run away when our king needs us desperately? We're going to run away? That's not the right thing to do. I'm going to go back and I'm going to stand next to my king because I made a promise that I would be there to help him. Right? So Wiglaf does. Only problem is by the time Wiglaf gets back, are you ready for this? Beowulf has been bitten in the neck by the dragon. Now think about this for a moment. Students always say to me, Dude, I hate these old stories. Our new movies are so much more sophisticated and modern. Really? Can you imagine going to a Jackie Chan film where at the end of the film, the bad guy pulls out a 45 and whoo, just blows away Jackie Chan. He falls down dead, roll the credits. <laughs> Who goes to a Jackie Chan film like that? Nobody, right? Because why? We expect Jackie Chan, our hero, to always win. Interestingly, the Beowulf epic is pretty sophisticated. Are you ready for this? In Beowulf Part 3, Beowulf is going to die. Yes! Yes, he's going to die. Think about a Batman film where he really does die at the end. Think about a Spider-Man episode where at the end of the film, he's dead. See how that's worse? Well, a modern, we don't like this. We don't like our superheroes to die. Our superhero will die in Beowulf. He does die. But before he dies, two things. Wiglaf helps him kill the dragon. So in other words, the old man Beowulf needed the help of the young man Wiglaf to win. Two. Before Beowulf dies, he has to speak his last words. Three things of importance that he says. If you've ever seen a movie where the guy is going to die, but before he dies, he has to speak final words, much of that comes from this poem, this epic, right? Beowulf has to speak his final words. He says three things. One, I've tried to live a good life. And most importantly, he says, I've never killed anybody within my own tribe. No civil war. Two, he says, I want to see the gold and the jewels of the dim uh, and the diamonds of the dragon before I die. And I want all of that money to go to my people after my death. Three, most interestingly, he says, I want to be remembered by the construction of a lighthouse called Beowulf's Barrow or Lighthouse. A lighthouse. What do you mean a lighthouse? What does a lighthouse do? Sits out on the edge of the cliff. When the fog comes in, what's the lighthouse for? It shows you where to go. Got it. It shows sailors how to look up and know how to navigate so that they don't crash on the rocks and die. Question, why would Beowulf, Beowulf asked to be remembered through a lighthouse. Why would Beowulf ask to be remembered through a lighthouse? Good. Beowulf's life is like a guide, isn't it? A guide for who? For Especially for who? Anglo-Saxon warriors, right? That is to say, Beowulf will serve as a lighthouse or a guide. The Beowulf epic will end with the death of Beowulf and great concern about who will become the next king. It seems that maybe Wiglaf is going to take over and will become the next king. There's always this problem if you have a king for your leader, right? They don't vote for kings, right? So there's always the question of what happens when a king gets old and dies? Who gets to step in and lead next? Because sometimes that can be a bad situation. For example, two people might fight over power or whatever. Our poem will then end with the death of Beowulf. So there we go. Final comment for your notes. We call this the Anglo-Saxon poem. 
If we want to know something about the Anglo-Saxon people, we're going to learn it in this poem. A question I want you to write down that we're going to answer now in our conversation tomorrow is this. What do these people think of as important? And in what ways is it still important? Right? What do these people, these Anglo-Saxons, what do they think of as important? What matters in their life? What are the things that matter most? Okay. And secondly, how is it possible that our Western culture, built in large measure off of a poem like this, we still are kind of there? Why do we take pictures of young athletes and put them out in our trophy case? See? What, what, what's up with that? Why do we select one person out of the whole team? in honor and, respect, and show respect to them. See, why do we do that? Of course, today we still do this thing with trophies, don't we, right? We still like the idea of trying to celebrate and remember important events. And finally, what is a hero? So you want to write this question down. We're going to answer all these questions. What is a hero? And why does the hero act the way the hero acts? What motivates the hero? Okay? For example... Dude, Batman could walk into any bank and just take all the money out. Spider-Man could use his magic powers and go and kill the president and take over the world. Why do superheroes not use their powers for bad when they could? Beowulf could show up at Rothgar's house and just slit his throat, take over the land of Denmark. Why doesn't he do that? Why does he risk his own life to fight against a monster and he doesn't even live in that country? See, this is going to be our question for our paper we're getting ready to write. The motivations behind why Beowulf does what he does. You'll see these motivations explained as you read the text Beowulf itself. We'll have more.